Let me analyze today's uh, inflation release. And there's a few things that I think might be a little under the radar. Uh, the number actually was pretty predictable, uh, mainly because everybody noticed that the price of gas had gone down very substantially, $5 a gallon to approximately four. That's gonna have some impact on the CPI. So that drop of 7% uh, translated uh, into a very heavy contribution to reducing the CPI. However, gasoline is only 5.2% of the CPI. There's another component that's much more important, food. And food, the monthly number annualized was about 13%. So while you've got this good news of a decrease in the price of gasoline, you've got an increase in the price of food and other components. Another very important component is the shelter component. This is 32% of the CPI. And that component has been growing and it will continue to grow. And let me come back to that. But first, let's look at the data so we can analyze exactly what's going on. So what I've done is I've looked at the, uh, the CPI changes on a monthly basis, then I annualize that, and I also look at the year-over-year -year, uh, CPI over the past uh, year and a half. Everything in green below is just a placeholder, so a forecast. So one thing with CPI, it's really difficult to forecast the next month, but you know what you're dropping. So the observation 12 months ago, you're actually dropping. So that you know for sure. And you can kind of see this here, that the announcement today effectively drops the first red number, that 0.48%, and then it adds the number that we saw today, which was effectively 0%, or negative 0.01%. So when you drop that high number and replace it with a lower number, then that actually reduces the inflation rate. And we saw that we went from 9.1% to 8.5% today. So what I wanna do, because people are thinking, oh, well, inflation has stopped. So we'll quickly get back to two or 3%. And that's definitely not the case. It's not the case mechanically, and it's not the case structurally. So let's first talk about the mechanics. So first, what I've done is just made a simple assumption, and it's a pretty extreme assumption. And that is, what happens if the next number of months, we just repeat the same monthly inflation, which is zero? So in green, I just plug in zero rate of inflation, and I wanna point out a few things. So number one, look at that October release. So October 13th is the last release before the midterm elections. Notice that even if we have no inflation over the next two releases, the rate of inflation that will print in October is 8%. So we still have an eight handle, and it's very trivially below the 8.5% that we see today. So that scenario is a very optimistic scenario in terms of inflation. So let's actually go to another optimistic scenario, and that is what happens if we actually have inflation that is on an annualized basis only 3%. That would be like ideal. That's kind of what the Fed is looking for. So again, I wanna point you at what is being dropped. So uh, the next announcement, we're dropping a 0.21% and the one after that, 0.27%. Uh, so let's kind of take the average of those two and that's a 0.25% or annualized 3%. And again, notice what happens here. So the October release, which again is the one before the midterm election, the inflation print would be 8.5%, identical to what we have today. Okay, so the next two months that we're dropping are very low uh, inflation rates. 
And essentially, if we get anything above that, the rate will actually increase in the next two months. Another thing that is it's kind of obvious looking at the data, but a lot of people don't pick up, that we've already had. So year to date, so January through today, we've already had 6.3% inflation. So if you think that inflation is going to end the year at 2 or 3%, it means that we're going to have strong negative inflation or deflation. And I think that that's very unlikely. That's the mechanical piece. There's a structural piece also. So I mentioned housing being 32% of CPI. Well, a lot of the time we compare the inflation today to 40 years ago. And it's a false comparison because the way inflation was calculated 40 years ago is different than it's calculated today. So 40 years ago, inflation was calculated based upon the price of housing. And today, we use a different technique, which is called owner's equivalent rent, which essentially smooths that uh, increase in housing over many uh, months or years even. So what does that mean? Um, well, it means that if we wanted to do a true apples to apples comparison, then what we would use is the same technique in 1981 and apply it today. If we did that, the rate of inflation would not be 8.5%. It'd be more like 12 or 13%. So again, uh, people saying, well, this is really good news that we've gone from 9.1 to 8.5. Well, um, it would be greater under a different calculation. And this is the structural point. There's more to come. And it's because of this smoothing. And, and let me give you a simple intuition that's based on like actual renting. So forget the owner's equivalent rent. Let's just talk about rentals. So suppose that rents just go up 10%. And because the end of leases are staggered, that the people whose rent expire at the end of the month, the rent goes up 10%. But everybody else, is held at the old rent. And then the next month, another cohort get their rent increased 10%. And it takes a year to actually work through, assuming everybody's got one year leases. The point I'm making is a simple point. If you look at the Case-Shiller 20, year over year, it's up almost 20%. If you look at the survey of actual rents, you're well into the double-digit territory. Yet the numbers that are being reflected in the CPI don't reflect what's already happened. We're running 6 to 7% inflation in terms of rentals. The point is, this inflation has already happened, but it's not reflected in the CPI. And it will be reflected over the next year or maybe even longer. So anybody who's telling the story, oh, well, this is just supply chain or geopolitical risk, and we'll quickly be back down to 1%, 2 3%, no. You need to look at the actual structure of how inflation is calculated. And the most important component, 32% of the CPI, there's inflation that is not reflected yet, that is yet to work its way through the system. This means that we are, unfortunately, going to go through a period of prolonged, persistent, high inflation.